Richard, thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, can I first of all just assure you uh, that the fact that uh, I don't have a tie on does not uh, suggest a, a, a statement of sympathy with the hedge fund community. Um, uh, it's simply that I have the combination of a rather bad uh, throat and a very stiff neck. Uh, so uh, even with my tie off, there is a danger uh, that in the middle of this uh, a talk, uh, there will be a lot of coughing and spluttering. And I, I just uh, uh, ask for your apologies, uh, your uh, a allowance in advance for that. I apologize in advance for that. So the future of finance. Uh, which the book is related, is focused on the future of finance, but it's quite interesting to think then about the recent past of finance. And one of the most striking things about the recent past of finance, recent in the sense of the last 200 years of uh, market capitalism, is how much the role of finance in the economy uh, has increased. On a whole load of dimensions, from about uh, the mid-last century onwards, but particularly from the 1970s and 80s onwards, the relative scale of finance within and relative to uh, the real economy increased. And you can see that both in increasing levels of leverage, uh, corporate debt to GDP, household debt to GDP, uh, but above all, financial debt to GDP, i.e. debt contracts which were internal to the financial industry. Those began to grow very dramatically after uh, the uh, 1970s, as you can see there. We also had a huge increase in the complexity of finance. From about the 1980s onwards, we were seeing the development of derivatives, interest rate derivatives, credit derivatives, and structured credits. And we had a huge increase in the scale of trading activity uh, within the economy, uh, so that the ratio of, for instance, oil trading uh, relative to a, uh, the amount of physical oil produced in the world went from a small fraction to 10 times. Uh, and as you can see there, uh, the ratio of tr FX trading values relative to world GDP uh, was transformed utterly. So a huge increase in the relative role of finance in all its aspects within the economy. And ahead of the crisis, there was a very strong confidently asserted conventional wisdom that all this increase in financial intensity had been a good thing and that it had been a good thing in two respects. First of all, that it had increased the allocative efficiency of the economy by better allocating capital to productive uses and has therefore spurred growth. And secondly, that for a variety of reasons, it had made the financial system more stable. And it is quite extraordinary in retrospect to look at the sort of things which were written by the IMF Global Financial Stability Review only as late as April 2006, explaining how this explosion of financial activity had made the, the whole economy uh, more stable. Now, we know post-crisis that that isn't true. First of all, on the allocative efficiency point, actually there is no real evidence that this massive growth in the scale of the financial system from the 1970s onwards actually spurred allocative efficiency or growth. If you actually look at the long sweep of economic history, it's a fact that the period of what is called financial repression, that's the phrase that uh, uh, Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff use in their recent book, the period of financial repression from the mid-1930s through to the 70s, actually after the Second World War, that was a period of pretty rapid growth. The economies managed to develop, both in the rich developed world and in emerging economies like Japan and Korea, pretty well without this huge intensity of financial activity. So the growth relationship is not necessarily there. That doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't values of particular forms of increased financial deepening or liberalization, but it does mean that we can't buy off on a sort of generalized relationship between financial deepening and liberalization and economic growth as being clearly beneficial at a top level. As for the stability argument, well, I think that argument pretty much turned to dust in 2007, 2008, when it was pretty clear that we had a huge economic crisis whose origins lay not in overpowerful trade unions or uh, too much government debt or irresponsible monetary policy, but within the financial system itself. And in the face of that crisis, there are some things 
which we knew and we recognized immediately are obviously wrong uh, with the financial system that developed. And we can enumerate them. They're things like badly designed uh, incentives that created bonuses for people to do risky things and then walk away from the consequences. Overuse of credit rating agencies, uh, a conflicts of interest within credit rating agencies. The development of over-complex and a misunderstood products, CDOs, CDO squares, which had deeply embedded options, uh, which the uh, uh, investors didn't understand, and often the people who were selling them didn't understand it either. Over-reliance on mathematical models, which placed too much face on our ability to model future assumptions by looking at uh, the recent past. One can enumerate a whole series of specific things that went wrong, and it is very important that the regulatory agenda addresses those specific things. But the key thing that I want to say is that if we only focus on those specific things that went wrong and don't focus on the fundamentals, uh, we will not do enough to reduce the probability and severity of a repeat performance. Essentially what I'm saying is if we define the problem as being greedy bankers encouraged by badly designed incentives selling CDO squares, if you define that as the problem, we will not really go to the essence of what went wrong and what we need to do about it. To work out what went wrong, we also need to go back to what does a financial system do within the real economy, why is that valuable, and why does it tend to create some risks which we then need to manage. I think it's useful to think about the financial system functions under a fourfold categorization. Payment services, insurance services, which can be wholesale or retail, uh, which can be life or, or general, the creation of markets, markets in foreign exchange and commodities, and financial intermediation, financial intermediation between providers of funds and users of funds. Now, I'm going to talk entirely about function three and function four, and I'm going to do that because that is where the problems arose in this crisis and have arisen in most crises. Payment services are very important, but on the whole, we manage them pretty well, and they don't end up forming crises. There have not been many major systemic crises, in fact, I'm not sure there have been any, related to insurance services. Individual insurance companies go wrong, but they don't tend to create systemic crises. The fundamental problems lie within four and, to a degree, in three. Within four, what do we mean by intermediation? What we have is a process that links providers of funds with users of funds. Part of that intermediation, though this bit you could almost not call intermediation at all, is the facilitation of matched direct investments. What I mean is that by a matched investment is where the saver sees a contract which has the same risk and return characteristics as the user sees. So if I buy a bond from a corporate, that bond has the same characteristics to me as it has to the corporate who issued it to me. And part of what the financial system does through market making, through research and distribution, is facilitate those matched relationships. But actually, the really important things that it does, and the thing that introduces risk into the system, is that it intermediates unmatched asset and liability contracts. It does a set of things that enables savers to hold a different combination of risk, return, and maturity than the borrowers, the users of funds, face. And it does that fundamentally through four functions. The first is pooling of risks, which enables you in a bank account to hold indirectly a small share in the pooled risk of lots of SME loans rather than to individually lend money to an individual SME. It does it through maturity transformation, which is achieved through two functions. One is on a bank balance sheet, enabling you to have an on-demand deposit which has been lent out in a 20-year loan. Or it does it through market liquidity, enabling you to hold an equity which you can sell tomorrow, even though to the corporate that equity is permanent funds. And finally, it does it by what I call risk return transformation through tranching. I'll illustrate that later, but what it essentially means is that you have a whole load of moderately risky loans on the asset side of a bank balance sheet, and on the liability side, you have some close to zero risk deposits, and you have some bank equity, which is really quite risky. And that is essentially a risk return tranching process. Now, all these functions are of value to the real economy, 
These are not socially useless, if I can use that phrase. They have a social and economic value, but all of them in different ways introduce risks. And to me, the essence of what we are doing in regulating and managing the financial system is understanding that there is value here, but there are also risks that need to be managed. So what my chapter does, and actually the speech I'll give this morning has taken it a little bit further, and uh, there's another lecture I gave to the European banking historians in May, which alongside this chapter really uh, pulls together what I'm trying to say here. What I believe is that to understand the why we just faced this crisis and why it was such a severe crisis, we have to understand the interaction of five different sources of instability within financial systems and what was so toxic about the latest crisis was that they were all there and they interacted. The first is a comment about all financial markets being inherently susceptible to irrational exuberance. The second is that credit contracts create specific risks. The third is that banks in particular create specific risks. The fourth, and this is a crucial thing that I want to say, and I think it's very important, that different categories of credit perform very different economic functions and that credit finance for property is deeply pro-cyclical. And the final one is about securitization, which appeared to and could have removed risks, but actually introduced some new risks, which are actually related to point one. And I'm going to say that the latest crisis was so severe, essentially because we have to understand it as an interaction between the inherent risks of credit, of banks, of property loans, and liquid traded markets. Let me begin with all financial markets are subject to inherent susceptibility to divergence from equilibrium. These are fundamentally the points which are set out over a long period of time by, for instance, Charles Mackay in his great 1840 book, Extraordinary Public Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, uh, by Charles Kindleberger in his great book on manias, panics, uh, and delusions. Um, what we know is that liquid financial markets have inherent tendencies to be subject to momentum and herd effects. And we have a set of explanations of why that is true. Broadly speaking, there are two categories of explanation. One of them draws on psychology, the sort of Danny Kahneman stuff, evolutionary biology, and says human beings are not entirely rational. They also have instinctive reactions, and we need to understand this as, a, to, to, to a degree, irrational. There is another school of thought which says, no, even if people are utterly rational, but operating in conditions of imperfect information and imperfect principal-agent relationships, then the interaction of perfectly rational people can produce collectively irrational or unstable results. And Paul Woolley's a chapter in the book relates to that school of thought. I don't think we have to choose between those two schools of thought. I think they are complementary in enabling us to understand that all financial, liquid financial markets are capable of significant and disruptive divergences from rational equilibrium uh, values. But what then is really interesting is that those divergences seem to have very different economic effect according to which market they're in. And in particular, when we get something like the internet boom and bust, shown here by the NASDAQ index between 1998 and 2002, it's a huge boom and bust. A lot of people lose a lot of money, make a lot of money. Quite a lot of young people spend a bit of wasted life setting up completely unnecessary websites. But at the end of the day, it doesn't wreak all that much havoc in the real economy in terms of unemployment or aggregate a, uh, levels of growth. But when we get upsets in the credit markets, in markets for debt, for credit, shown here by a period of irrational exuberance in corporate bond spreads going down to that very low point of 2005 through to 2007 and then soaring back up again, that is when we get major disruption to uh, the real economy. And IMF figures have clearly shown that output losses in different categories of recession are higher when we have recessions linked to financial stress, but they're highest when they link, are related to banking-related crisis. There is something about irrational exuberance in the market for credit, which is more disruptive for the economy than irrational exuberance and then despair in the market for commodities or equities. Now, why is that? I think it's because credit contracts create specific risks. 
And I think there are four particular characteristics of credit contracts which are very important to understand. Specificity of tenor, of nominal value, the rigidities of default and bankruptcy, and the interaction with real asset values. Specificity of tenor essentially means when you make a loan, it's got to be repaid at a particular date. That's not true of an equity contract. Equity contracts are permanent. And that has the very particular fashion, uh, a, a, a implication, that the economy needs a continual supply of new credit because at any time a whole load of existing credit is being repaid. Switch off the credit machine, the new credit flow machine, and we have economic problems. Not true of equity. You could imagine a circumstance in which there were no new primary equity issues for three or four years. There'd be some disadvantages to the economy, but there wouldn't be a complete collapse of the economy. But credit needs to be continually recycled. Secondly, it's specific in nominal value. And that means that if there is major unexpected inflation, either up or down, you create problems. Obviously, there are problems with hyperinflation, but actually some of the biggest problems here are deflation. When you have nominal value contracts faced with deflation, you have unexpected increases in the real value of those contracts, and those can, as Irving Fisher explained in his great article on debt deflation, play havoc with the real economy. Thirdly, rigidities of default and bankruptcy. Ben Bernanke, in his essays on the Great Depression, in one of them, he makes the point that in a world of, in the Arrow de Bruyne world of uh, perfectly state contingent contracts and complete markets, we would never see default and bankruptcy. Default and bankruptcy is a contradiction of smoothly operating markets because in smoothly operating markets, as a firm approached the conditions which produce bankruptcy, we would have smoothly operating translation of debt contracts uh, through to credit, credit contracts. We don't see that. What we see when credit contracts go down is huge, irreversible, one-off and extremely disruptive processes, bankruptcies and fire sales, which drive companies into liquidation and which produce self-reinforcing falls in asset values. Those are specific to credit contracts. Finally, interaction with real asset values, the way in which credit and asset values work in a self-reinforcing cycle. I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. So credit contracts introduce instability. But it's not just credit contracts which introduce instability. It's not just credit which is different. Bank credit is even more specific. Essentially, what leveraged fractional reserves banks do is to increase the range of potential contracts available to both users and suppliers of funds. And they do that by making it possible for suppliers to hold assets with different combinations of risk return and maturity from those which the users of funds face in their liabilities. They do this by two mechanisms. First of all, they maturity transform, enabling you to hold liquid deposits against medium to long-term maturity loans. And they tranche by risk and return, having on their asset side a whole load of moderately risky loans but then on their liability side, the ability for people to choose between close to zero risk deposits and the spectrum through to high risk equity. Now those transformation functions appear to deliver significant economic benefits, at least at some stages of economic development. And indeed, economic historians of 19th century Britain have often argued that Britain's more developed banking system was one of the factors driving superior economic performance. And the reason why it might do that is that these maturity, these transformation functions facilitate the mobilization of savings which would be, have been more difficult if savers had had to be linked to users of funds through untransformed contracts in which, as it were, there'd have to be a link between the risk return and maturity of what the saver wants and what the borrower, the entrepreneur, uh, the business builder wants to issue. And that essentially is what uh, Walter Badgett was arguing in Lombard Street when he said the points on this chart, that more cash exists out of banks in France and Germany and in all the non-banking countries than in our uh, countries, but the cash is not attainable. This is borrowable money. Essentially, what Badgett is arguing is that banks, through these transformation functions, help the mobilization of savings. And I think it almost certainly is true that that was a very important part at that stage of economic development and that there are countries like India today which would undoubtedly get a benefit from financial deepening 
from having bank assets and liabilities higher as a percentage of GDP than they currently are. I think the interesting question is to whether the benefits of this switch off at a certain stage and whether we are beyond the benefits of financial uh, deepening. Because it's quite clear that these benefits of leveraged fractional reserve banks bring with them very significant risks. Banks facilitate greater leverage in the real economy and they are leveraged themselves, increasing the dangers that arise from the specific characteristics of credit rather than equity contracts. And I should have said earlier that the implication of what I said earlier on credit contracts is that the more credit contracts there are within the economy, the more fragile it is, the more vulnerable it is to shocks because it has more of those rigid contracts. Obviously also they introduce maturity transformation risks and related confidence and contagion risks rooted in the very simple fact that banks create a set of contractual liabilities which legally have a right to simultaneous execution but which banks could never simultaneously honour if everybody wanted them honoured at the same time. Banks are inherently risky institutions which can only be made safe through the combined effect of capital and liquidity regulation and central bank liquidity insurance. Finally, banks have a very particular ability to drive credit and asset price cycles, which was the fourth specific feature of credit instruments, to which I'll now turn within a consideration of my fourth point, the point that different categories of credit perform very different economic functions. Credit contracts have grown hugely within our economy. Credit contracts, debt contracts, whichever way you want to express it. If we take household and private non-financial corporation sterling deposits, the lending equivalent of sterling M4, over the last 40 years, shown by the, black, uh, the, 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 the dark blue or black line there, you can see that lending to the economy, the extension of credit, has gone from about 22-24% of the economy to 125%. So the scale of credit contracts that we have has hugely increased. You'll also notice that actually the scale of bank deposits has very significantly increased. And of course, that illustrates the way that banks simultaneously create credit and money in a, and bank money in a self-reinforcing uh, cycle. Now, the vast majority of this debt has been lent by banks. So you see a little green slice up at the top, which is the development of securitization. So banks have delivered more leverage to the real economy. But with two-thirds of the loan assets being long-term mortgages and with deposits primarily short-term, they have also delivered much more maturity transformation. And so we have developed, delivered two, much more of those two functions of maturity transformation and uh, increased uh, leverage. And in many debates about credit extension and about the impact of new prudential regulations which may restrict it, what it is assumed is that these contracts primarily perform the following function, that they link deposits who are savers to borrowers investing in productive assets. And you will find in most of the discussions about how high should capital requirements be at the moment, the implicit model on the right hand side here, which is a marginal efficiency of capital uh, type model, in which there exist within society a whole load of potential investment contracts, uh, uh, projects, ranked by the rate of return, and according to the price of credit, according to how easy it is to get credit, uh, then we will have a different level of investing. So more credit and cheaper credit supply is often assumed in a lot of uh, contributions to the debate to be good for business investing, enabling more investment projects to exceed the cost of capital, and uh, therefore capital and liquidity regulations which restrict credit supply or increase it price are assumed to produce harmful effects on growth through their impact on investment. And you will see in a lot of the debates today the idea that the fundamental trade-off we face is between greater stability and greater investment or growth. But I think it is really important to understand that only a minority of credit extension in the UK and in other rich developed markets now performs this economic function. Whereas in 1964, a mental model in which UK banks took household deposits and lent them on to business captured much of the reality, 
Over the last 40 years, that has fundamentally changed. And the biggest single driver of lending growth has been residential mortgage uh, lending, and in particular, uh, lending to the household sector, and in particular, residential mortgage lending. Now, this intermediation, what is going on here is essentially intermediation from household deposits to household lending. I take out a mortgage, I buy a house from you, you deposit money in the bank. Think about that as the most important thing that is going on in the banking system, rather than I save, I put it in a bank, uh, you lend it off uh, to an SME. This intermediation from household deposits to household mortgages is socially useful. But its social value is only to a very limited extent related to new physical investment in the housing stock. Its social value primarily derives from the extent to which it enables effective life cycle consumption smoothing and intergenerational investment uh, resource transfer. I think that's clearest the case in unsecured consumer lending. If you make a deposit and I take out an unsecured consumer loan, what you and I have essentially done is trade off consumption in two different time periods. I've decided that I like my consumption now and I'm willing to have a little less consumption throughout my life cycle in order to have it early, you've decided you want your consumption later and you're willing to be rewarded with a bit of interest to get there. But that really has pretty much nothing to do with the processes of saving going through to investment. An awful lot of unsecured debt, but also residential debt, uh, residential mortgage debt, think of it as being life cycle consumption smoothing and intergenerational resource transfer rather than that mental model of saving intermediated through to productive investment. The other thing which has occurred in the mix of loans is that in the corporate sector, they are now in he incredibly heavily concentrated in lending to commercial real estate. And actually, if I showed you it on a net basis, with how much does the manufacturing sector deposit with the banks and how much does the lend with the banks and how much does the commercial real estate sector borrow from the banks and how much is deposit with the banks, on a net basis, pretty much all lending by the UK banking system is to commercial real estate. Now, what is that lending about? Well, it is partly driven by new productive investment. And I am absolutely not saying that commercial real estate investment is a bad thing. It seems to me that actually investment in attractive urban space and offices, that is, and shopping, that's an essential part of investment uh, in a modern economy. But actually, a very significant amount of commercial real estate investment is not related to that. It is fundamentally about the leveraged purchase of existing assets with strong tax incentives to maximize leverage, often in the expectation of medium-term capital gain, and in some cases exploiting the put option of limited liability. And we have to understand that that is what credit is doing uh, within the economy. And what that implies is that there is a possibility, given the huge importance of lending against commercial real estate and lending against houses, that lending and asset prices can get linked in a self-reinforcing cycle. This is the sort of cycle that Hyman Minsky talked about when he talked about lending, uh, going from hedge finance to speculative finance to Ponzi finance. It's essentially banks lend money against commercial real estate or houses. The value of those houses go up. That then encourages both banks to lend more and borrowers to borrow more, and they go up further. And those cycles are absolutely fundamental, and policies to address that cycle need to be at the core of the response to the crisis. And to pull it all together, what I'm essentially saying is that we have to understand that there are very different drivers and there are different economic functions of different categories of debt. Some of them, such as residential mortgages or life cycles consumption smoothing, uh, have uh, residential mortgages or unsecured personal have very little to do with the finance of productive investment. I've, I've realized that something's gone wrong with this chart and you're missing the blobs, which should be against life cycle consumption smoothing for in particular unsecured personal lending and residential mortgages. And you're missing the blobs against 
uh, private incentives to borrow against expectations of asset appreciation that should be against residential mortgages and commercial real estate. But hopefully you get the idea, the fundamental mental model we have that all lending is savers put money in a bank, banks lend it to productive investment, that is only a small fraction of the functions which credit is performing within the real economy. Fifth conclusion is about securitization. Now, securitization, uh, what is it? Um, first of all, it's quite uh, important to realize securitization in the sense of credit securities, um, simple credit securities, uh, uh, government bonds or single name corporate bonds, those have existed for almost as long as bank loans, and they continue to play a major role in the credit extension uh, system. But what we call securitization is really the development from the 1970s on of new methods of extending the role of credit securities to new sets of issuers and buyers. And fundamentally, what securitization did was it applied two of the transformation functions that I referred to earlier. It pooled lots of small risks and turn them into a credit security so that you could buy a mortgage-backed security of lots of individual mortgages rather than just one bond of one issuer, IBM, and it tranched them. So it took a mix of credit risks on the issuer side and said, okay, which credit risk does the borrower want? Do they want a triple A slice or a double A or an equity slice? I mean, what's interesting there is that securitization actually, in a sense, performs the same risk tranching function performed by banks, but without the overt balance sheet-based maturity transformation. And by the early 21st century, securitized credit had reached very significant proportions, as you can see here, of US credit extension in home mortgages and consumer credit and commercial mortgages. And in the UK, it had reached about 20 to 25% of our mortgage market. And it seemed to deliver a set of benefits, or this is what people said about it. First of all, they said, we'll have better management of bank risks because banks will be able to originate and uh, distribute uh, credit, so they won't have to hold undiversified portfolios of the risk which happens to be generated by their particular client base in their particular region. They'll be able to uh, diversify risk. And by the way, it was said that will create a more stable system. It was also said that this will complete markets. Investors will be able to pick precisely that mix of risk return and liquidity which matches their investor preference. And it was said that's good because it facilitates credit extension. Now, that's an interesting argument because of course, whether credit extension is a good thing or not depends upon whether the level of credit in the economy is optimal and whether everybody taking on those credit uh, contracts is making a sensible uh, decision. But those were the arguments which were made. And at a more fundamental level, you could argue that there were fundamental, apparent, theoretical arguments in favor of securitization. The argue was, argument was that the assets would be held by end investors who would be non-leveraged or lightly leveraged investors rather than highly leveraged bank intermediaries. And that the maturity transformation would be achieved entirely through the marketability of the, uh, the instruments it would not take the form of that dangerous maturity transformation sitting on bank balance sheet. So those were the two arguments, the two theoretical arguments, why securitization would be a more stable system. Well, actually, both of those arguments turned out to be completely undermined by the actual practice of it. When the music stopped, it turned out that a large share of credit securities had not been distributed through to end investors, but they were sitting on bank trading books where I'm afraid we, the regulators, had provided a massive incentive for them to sit there by setting wholly inadequate trading book capital requirements against credit securities held in trading books. And it also turned out that though we told a story that by getting rid of the bank maturity transformation, we had a safer system, that wasn't true either because shadow bank maturity transformation through sieves and conduits uh, was equally risky and prone to contagion. So, that was uh, specific things which were wrong with the system and which actually we can put right. But my belief is that there was something more problematic about securitization. And the problem with securitization and credit derivatives is that it took more credit instruments 
into the arena of liquid financial markets and therefore subject to the self-referential processes of risk assessment and of pricing which exist in liquid financial markets. Now, of course, in the equity market, Keynes famously described the uh, process in the equity markets of the setting of prices as being like a pretty girl competition uh, in which everybody was trying to work out whom everybody else thought uh, the prettiest girl was uh, so that we devote our intelligence to anticipating in advance what average intelligence expectations believe average expectations are. And I think there was a major problem that the credit securities market extended that type of thinking to credit securities. At the time, though, it was believed, hello, it was believed that that process of self-referential pricing was a thoroughly good thing. The IMF Global Financial Stability Review in April 2006 said that the good thing about credit derivatives was that they enhanced the transparency of the market's collective view of credit risks and thus provide valuable information about broad credit conditions and increasingly set the marginal price of credit. But the point about setting the marginal price of credit on the basis of the market's collective view of credit risk rather than on your own bank analysis of credit risk is that that's only valuable if you believe that the market's collective view of credit risk is collectively rational. If instead you note that what the market believed was the credit risk of major banks, measured here by financial firms CDS on the bottom line which goes down and then shoots up, a line which fell relentlessly from 2002 till spring 2007, so that what the market's collective view of credit risk was telling us was that the banking industry had never been safer than in about May 2007, and then shot off in the other direction. If that is what the market's collective view of credit risk is telling you, then when you start using the market's collective view of credit risk as a bank to say, I no longer need to do credit analysis because I can simply look at the CDS spread and make, take my reference from there, then you have made the system more unstable, not uh, uh, more stable. And so I believe that credit and asset risk prices, that cycle, and Richard's been flashing at me to wrap up in one minute, and I will be two more minutes, Richard, that cycle of credit and asset uh, prices, which I referred to earlier, I think the fundamental problem we had in this crisis is that that cycle, which has always been there, in banking and in its relationship with asset prices, that the interface between that and the liquid traded markets of credit securities made it worse. And this cycle here explains how uh, it made it worse. So the essence of what I am saying about why this system became so risky was that there are fundamental problems in maturity transforming banks. There are fundamental problems in specific risks of credit contracts and that the more leverage you have within the economy, the more risk you will have. There are fundamental problems of credit financed asset price cycles and securitization increased the inherent instability by introducing to the credit cycle, which was already quite unstable and dangerous, the extra instability of self-referential prices. So that is what is my diagnostic. The speech which I have in the chapter goes a little bit on to what we then do about it, and let me simply end on 30 seconds on that. There are a set of radical structural reform responses for a set of reasons that I'm willing to say something to in answers either now or later this afternoon. I believe that some of these are valuable, some not, but all of them are insufficient. I believe the absolute essence of what we have got to do is to address the fundamental drivers of the credit cycle through a more heavily capitalized and more liquid banking system and that crucially we have to recognize that it is a cycle which has to be to a degree managed on a discretionary basis through the creation of new macro prudential tools which can lean against the cycle and take away the punch bowl before the party gets out of hand. And that is something which I know Andrew Large is going to talk about in his contribution to the debate. So let me end there. Thank you.
of questions. Uh, believe it or not, uh, under your armrest uh, there is a microphone. Um, <coughs> if, if you're asked to speak, press the button once and release and speak. And when you finish speaking, press the button once again uh, and stop speaking. Um, who would like to start off? Don't hesitate. Yes? So, so say who you are, please. Uh, Angela Wilkinson, University of Oxford. It's a wonderful tour de force the financial crisis as an indigenous systemic risk. And my, we're here talking about the future of financing, so I would like to know about how the finance system is going to think about its causality of exogenous systemic risks or the exogenous systemic risks that already exist. So beyond the concept of how do we better regulate Form and restructure the financial system and the role of banks into thinking about how this crisis has created real effects in the real economy and pensions, how investments are um, creating ecological debt. How are those exogenous systemic risks going to be incorporated in the future of finance? Thank you. Well, uh, I guess what I, I believe is that I mean, for instance, take ecological risks. I have a very strong interest in that myself. I'm also the chairman of the UK Climate Change Committee. But there is a value in problems in life by at least keeping them somewhat uh, separate. I mean, it, it is clearly the case that the instability of the financial system has a whole load of adverse effects on other aspects of our economy or uh, indeed potentially our ecology. I think, however, that the core of us thinking about the financial system, and you have expressed it well, is to understand that this has some very strong, naturally arising, endogenous pro-cyclical tendencies. That is the real essence of what I'm saying. And I am arguing that those endogenous pro-cyclical tendencies, which were always there in the processes of bank credit extension and its interface with asset prices, and in particular property of asset prices, was given an extra twist, an extra degree of endogeneity, as the credit asset price cycle became more closely interlinked with liquid traded markets. And I think the core of our response to the financial crisis must be to create a system which makes that less likely to occur, that we remove the extent to which the financial system itself is generating within itself an endogenous driver of instability. I think once we have done that, once we have a more uh, stable system, we can then address uh, you know, some other issues which are important uh, in themselves. So I, I hope I'm not avoiding the question, but I, I guess I am saying I'm, I'm a little bit wary of continually widening uh, the, 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 the field of vision uh, I think we have a difficult enough problem in taking a system, and again, I, I stress the essence of, of, of what I'm saying, I think we have to understand that there are deep structural reasons why these things are endogenously systemically unstable. And therefore, while I'm very keen on things like fixing, fixing banker bonuses and creating a world in which probably nobody will ever create a CDO squared because it was a pretty useless thing. I think if we stick to that line of country, we will not deal with the things which are fundamentally important. So I guess I'm saying let's, let's stick to this issue. Yeah. No, you seem to be talking. Actually. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Barbara from uh, University College London. I wonder whether you can... Uh, shortly in two sentences define what you mean by social welfare or social mm. usefulness. Oh, God. Um, how, you, <laughs> how the FSA um, can actually operationalize it in its everyday policy formulation work and how it would link it to the FSA statutory objectives. With great difficulty. Um, <laughs> well, Andy is going to talk a bit later, Andy Haldane, about the issue of how we measure the value added of the financial system. I, I can't give a full answer to that. I think it's very important. But clearly, there is, there is a value um, in the financial system achieving you know, growth, right? 
allocated financial efficiency and growth. Of course, if you read Richard Layard's stuff on happiness, it raises some questions about how important that is once you get beyond a certain level of GDP per capita. But actually, in the developed world, developing world, it's still very important. So, for instance, a, does India need a more deeply developed banking system uh, to more, it, uh, more effectively drive allocative efficiency and investment in order to drive growth? And will that be good for happiness? Yes, at that stage of development, absolutely, clearly. So there is a relationship to does it drive growth. I think the crucial thing to understand about the when I used the phrase socially useless last year, which got a certain notoriety, I think there are two, at least two, two things that I had in mind. First, I think there are within a rich developed economy quite a lot of activities which are fundamentally rent extraction. And Paul is going to talk about this issue of rent extraction, where fundamentally what the activity is doing is managing to take money out of your pocket and put it in my pocket. Um, without any allocative efficiency function which is driving growth and increasing the size of the economic cake. And I think there are, for a set of reasons that Paul will talk about, several fundamental reasons why there is a greater possibility of doing that in some areas of finance uh, than others. So I'm sort of trying to define what I mean by socially useless by excluding things that are not. I do not mean, I don't think, I don't think uh, rent extraction is socially valuable. I also think that there are some things which create instability, and I think instability is not only not useful, it is very strongly harmful, because again, all of Richard's stuff on uh, happiness and all the stuff on happiness tells us that although we can debate how important it is whether we get those final extra increments of economic growth, what is absolutely clear from all we know about welfare is that people hugely... A, uh, uh, dislike large volatility in, 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 uh, in income. They hugely dislike sudden setbacks either to their employment or to an already attained level of income and wealth. And those seem to be far more important uh, in the nature of happiness than minor accurate increments in GDP per capita. So extra GDP per capita allocative efficiency is important. Rent extraction is not socially useful. Creating instability can be socially negative in an optimal sense, in a social optimality sense, even if it minutely, the, the steps you do that minutely increase allocative efficiency, so there can be a trade-off there. Um, finally, I did stress, I think it's very important to believe that there are some aspects of social optimality which have nothing to do with growth. The fact is that in an economic theory basis, if you and I both have an income stream and you want to consume this year and are willing to pay me a bit of interest to do that, and I'm willing to delay my consumption till next year and get a bit of income, at least in the theory, as long as we are both well qualified to define our intertemporal uh, utility preferences, uh, and we truly are made happy by that, um, that is, uh, at least in theory, socially optimal. And one of the things I was stressing is that we have to understand that quite a lot of our, what our credit system does if it is socially valuable, is socially valuable in that function, and only a small element of it has much to do these days, only a small element is about allocative efficiency and investment. Just one final thought in relation to that, because I think this is important. Given that the amount of the credit system, which is to do with the flow of credit to a company, large, medium, or small, which is going to invest and drive growth, given that that is a small amount of the credit system, we do have to think about, and this really is heresy to the previous free market ideology, whether we might ever want to preference that category of credit extension against, for instance, credit extension to leverage up against an existing asset. For instance, I think we do face a very difficult challenge over the next few years of heading towards a, lever a less leveraged uh, economy. And I think it is quite possible that as we increase the capital and liquidity requirements, there will be some constraints on credit extension, and then there will be squeals that that credit extension is limiting the growth potentials of small and medium enterprises and corporates. And I think what we realize is that the elasticity of response of different categories of credit, whether it be to interest rate levers or to regulatory levers such as capital, may be very different.
If we try and slow booms down by increasing the interest rate, we may do real harm to that subset of credit which is about the finance of new productive investment long before we slow down an out-of-control commercial real estate boom. Now, that really does take you, and at the end of my speech, which you can look at and in the chapter, it takes you in the direction not only of macroprudential tools which lead, use quantitative mechanisms like counter-cyclical capital or a loan-to-value ratios to lean against the cycle, but a willingness to do that on a somewhat sectorally specific basis which divides between those different categories of credit according to their different category of social usefulness. That is heretical in our policy framework of the last 30 years, but I think it's something we need to think about, and I think Andrew, is, Andrew Large is going to talk about that later within his chapter, or at least it is suggested by that.